So we measure lots of things. Uh, we can measure anything today, anything. So it's important to know what you're trying to do. What are you trying to do with that metric? And there's lots of different metrics. And w the ones you pick and how you do it really matter. And sometimes you're trying to answer a question. Sometimes you're trying to make a point. Sometimes you're doing an analysis that's going to guide a real code change that's going to change an experience for your users. And knowing what you're going in with is really going to set the right tone for what you choose to measure. Oh, a little fast on the trigger there. OK, so when we, when we pick those items to measure, when we do that, we're basically saying, what's our focus and what's the outcome that we want? And how we do that is really going to change that focus and that outcome. And I'll give you some examples of what this means. These are all things that I've had to measure and that you'll have to measure. And some of you are already measuring or trying to measure. Or people are asking you, well, what's it going to do for this? And how do I move that? It's a soup of data. So how do you figure out what really matters and how to organize your data in such a way that you can predict the outcomes that you can predict what changes are going to yield the outcome that you want to see in the business. So the, the first thing I think about is, what am I trying to do? What's the action? What's the change I want to, to take? And when, I, when you're thinking about metrics, it's really about finding the ones that are actionable because it links a repeatable action something that you can do, or that your users will do, or that your customers will do, or whoever it is that you're, is using your product, and that that action that you're going to change how they take is going to yield an outcome that you can me also measure. So you're linking. It's linking these things. And then that link should be through correlation and causality. And I know you guys probably all know, but I love correlation and causality. We talk about it all the time. Um, so, oh, come on. I'm having a technical difficulty. Oh, here we go. Let's take a minute to talk about correlation and causality. So, maybe this is a repeat, but it bears just refreshing that correlation is when your data moves together. So, you see something, you make a change, and an action happens, and they are linked, right? They're linked information. And so it's very easy to sort of see like, oh, those two things are together. They make sense together. But they're not always actually causal. So in causal, you can actually see and show that A causes B. And these do not always, it's not always obvious that this is the case. So I'm just going to take it. This is a real example from a real retail situation. So there was a, a seasonal dip every year. Um, and in January, obviously, like almost every retail environment has a seasonal dip in January. In this particular case, the team tried to figure out how are we going to get over this dip? How are we going to really boost sales in January to do this? So they actually spent months, months coming up with some great marketing, an email campaign and a bunch of other marketing on the site that supported it. And they did a huge campaign. And the campaign was gorgeous. And the responses and like test, you know, offline testing that we did were really, really good. They did the campaign in January. It ran um, in the middle of January. And it was a complete failure. So the actual results were actually less even than the predictions for the, the lower um, dip in holiday sales that were expected. So the team was absolutely devastated because they were really confident in this creative. And it was just such a bottoms out failure. Um, I'll, I mean, some of you are smiling. I'm sure you can guess what was actually happening. Uh, anyone want to take a, just a wild guess at what was going on? What was holiday, there was a snowstorm all over the East Coast. <laughs> and literally, people couldn't get to work. And the last thing that they wanted to do was go shopping. So literally, this huge snowstorm, a series of snowstorms, but basically it was just a weather event. And it happened to exactly correspond to the dates of this huge marketing campaign. So it took a while. It was maybe like you know, multiple weeks of very, very sad and unhappy people looking at a lot of information to figure this out. But basically, 
they, what, what was really going on was that there was no causality in there. And my only point of this is to say, sometimes you think you know what's going on, it looks super, super obvious, but then if you can dig in and really figure out what's going on, you can find out that it's not, just not really the case. And it happens in a lot of other examples that are less dramatic than this. We see it a ton when we're looking at data. Um, and I'm sure you are and do. So the metric is actionable when it's a repeatable action that you're going to change the way people are taking it, and it's going to lead to an observable outcome through causation. So we're a real-tail site, and we want to increase purchases. This is, this is pretty standard. I'm just going to use this as an example to show you kind of how I think about structuring the data, for, particularly for stakeholders, which I feel like is one of the hardest parts about being a product manager. How do you talk about data in a really easy way without getting sort of lost in the stuff? So we want to increase purchases from, from X to Y. This is obviously a little bit simplified, but we don't have much time. And so first we need to really think about like how does that happen? So what are those set of observable actions that lead to an outcome that you know are causal? So I just, I, this is a very basic kind of retail funnel, but I've worked in retail at a number of different places and basically they look just like this. <laughs> like all my retail funnels look basically some variant of this, maybe with a few more steps, but very simple. So you build your funnel and you know what comes in the top of the funnel and what comes through. And almost every business has this kind of people coming in, action being taken, and an outcome at the bottom. When I'm looking at the data, I'm looking for what is the nugget, what is the, the, that order of events that yields the outcome that I want in my business. And even at Hired now, where we have this really complex two-sided marketplace, we, I still have a funnel that's not much more complicated than this. That, that really explains how people are coming through the business. So linking in, here it's number of customers, they click, they visit the site, they engage. Just engage could be seven steps, but it's a step that you can sort of you know, pull up together to say, like, did they engage? And then they make a purchase, and that's your success. So build that basic funnel. And then for me, once I have this funnel, I use it all the time. Not some of the time, not most of the time, not when it's convenient, not when it's like, like, I use it all the time. And the reason is that it makes it clear for everybody else to understand that context when things are changing or how we're making decisions about what we're changing on the site because, or in the product if we're making changes, it's easy to link it back because I can link to where in the funnel I, I want to see an outcome from the change in the product. So if we want to increase purchases from X to Y, then we know we need to increase these other things at a predictable rate. And if we link and link it back every time the same way, then as you're going through your metrics, you're, you're always telling the same story, but every change that you make, you're able to link it back in this really structured way. And your funnel might look different, and you may decide not to even have it be a funnel, but the idea is to be very clear about the business outcomes at a high level, at a business level. What affects the actual profit and loss of the company? And link your funnel back to that. So when you have your funnel, there's really only two ways to move it. You're either putting more people through it, or you're increasing the effectiveness of each step, or, or of, of a step or multiple steps in that funnel. That's it. There's no other magic. None of the other stuff that you do is going to change your funnel metrics. And this is a place where, as a product manager, I, and I'm sure that those of you who are product managers too, you get suggestions all the time for stuff that's great to do, fabulous ideas, but they're not going to change your funnel. They're not going to yield an outcome. And so being able to really clearly understand how certain changes are even able to affect your basic business funnel helps you do a very simple prioritization and to explain to people why that prioritization is important and why that idea, while brilliant, is you know, maybe not going to yield what they think or is like even bigger, even bigger opportunity than they think because it has a direct impact on either increasing the volume or improving the way that people are going through your funnel. 
So another part of, oh, okay. I feel like I should like not touch it, okay. So another element I wanna talk about is segmentation. So people talk a lot about segmentation and what does it mean? And for, in this context, when you're sort of building in your funnel metrics, and a funnel can be any series of steps that lead to your success outcome, the segmentation is really looking at that same data in the same way but through a different lens, cutting up the way that people are going through it and really looking. The most common are by source, where are your users coming from, by demographics, are they men, are they women, are they from a different country, How, just anything that's demographic about them. It could be psychographic also, but being able to cut up that data and see how they move through the funnel differently. This is probably the most useful type of uh, analysis is in being able to look at the same funnel, look at how different populations are moving through that funnel and see what the differences are between them. Because if one segment, um, I'll just give a, an example from our, uh, I used to work at a hair color company, and um, we had a particular segment of people who just didn't get through the funnel. They just didn't get through the funnel. They would come, they came in huge numbers into the top of the funnel, and then they just kind of dwindled out. And there was something about our product that just didn't appeal to that segment. But because we were able to separate them out, we were able to say, you know what, it actually is like much more successful than we thought for this other demographic segment, but for the one that it's not appealing, we can actually segment them out, treat them differently. We had to build some mechanisms to do this, and then we were able to try to optimize for that segment, because it was a pretty big segment. Um, but we also would have been able to make the choice to just not work on that segment, because they're just not yielding anything. So then we could also make the decision, if we wanted to, to say, you know what, those guys are never going to convert. That's just not our audience. They don't want this product. You know, I mean, if there's certain people just don't want your stuff, like, that's fine. Don't waste time trying to convince them to do it. Work on the segment that has some opportunity, and if you're able to segment them out of your data, then you're not going to be confused by them all the time, and you can really focus on them. So segmentation is really important. I had a great product manager who worked for me, one of the best product managers I've worked with, and he was so rigorous about this. He would come through and show me the funnel, and then he would show me the segmentation, and what he would do, and I recommend this to everybody, is he would look for the best performing funnel, and then use that as his benchmark to say, this is my best performing segment. How can I get all my other segments here? This is what I know is possible because I see it in this, in this piece of my funnel, in these customers, I see how good it can be. I see what conversion rates are possible for me and I can prove it because I can show you when these customers come in in this source, they perform really, really well. So what's working for them and how do I figure out how to make that work for the other segments that I'm looking at? So segmentation is a very powerful way to cut your data and set some really clear targets for how to improve your product to get the outcomes that you want for those segments. So we gained some insight. Did I skip? No, okay. We gained some insight. We, sh we, sh we did some tests. How do we show people? How do we show people what, what we did? And one of the most sort of helpful things is to show people the outcome in exactly the way that you showed them that you made the decision to work on that segment. So I literally use exactly the same slides, exactly. So I say, this is what we're gonna do, and this is why. And then I bring the exact same set of data back and show the difference. And that sort of closes the loop in a way that is really clear and takes away all the sort of confusion about whatever else might have been happening or specifics about the project, this sort of consistency of the way you look at the data in making the decision, and then that same consistency when you're going back and saying what you learned after you made that change is really, really helpful to bring your stakeholders along with you and avoid confusion about the difference. You know, sometimes you go into a project, you think it's totally clear, you come out, you're like, what did we learn? If you can present it in exactly the same way, then it's, it's really, really clear to people. So this is just a, you know, obviously slides are 
a little bit abbreviated, but it's exactly the same. And all I'm, all I'm doing is I can call out and say, before the change it was this, and here's how much we moved it. Before the change it was this, and this is how much we moved it. And then the, the other thing I pull in is what's the business number? So here we were talking about purchases, but of course when you report purchases, you really want to talk about revenue. Sometimes revenue doesn't totally go up at the same rate that the purchase number goes up, but you can show that relationship. So communicating consistently and tying it back both visually and in the language that you use really helps with stakeholder management and makes it easy for other people to understand why you made a decision to do it, what the outcome was, and exactly where that outcome was. So let's say you tried lots of things. Then you can't just do like pre, post. You really need to think about how do we over time see the effect of lots of different changes. I don't know about exactly how all of you are managing your products. At Hired, we do continuous release. We might release five different things in a week. They all have different metrics. But in the end, we have one funnel as a company. And so the question is, you want to measure the, effect, the local effects of each change that you make when you can do that. But you also need to make sure that the sum total of all the changes that you're making are really paying off in the way that you want them to. Because some of your tests are going to be great, and some are going to be terrible, and you're going to do some stuff without testing, and you're going to do some other stuff that's like really well researched. But all that stuff is one product, usually. So how do you think about lots of stuff going on at the same time? So cohorts. I love cohorts. Um, Cohorts are like the best thing that ever happened <laughs> in data management for me in like this product management job of like managing change. What do we decide to do? How do we know if it's successful? This is like the, the bread and butter. And cohorts are really just showing variations between groups of people um, at the same stage of the customer lifecycle over time. Um, I've spent a lot of time doing subscription businesses in subscription businesses, every day or every week or every month, however you want to cut it, you've got fresh people, like fresh new members of your subscription product. Um, at Netflix, we lived and died by the new people that came in. We were like, how many new people? You know, who gets them? Who, who gets to test on them and how many of them? This was back in the day before there were bazillions of people using it. You had to like compete for what tests could go on at the same time. But Cohorts let you do this, and it doesn't have to be just time. Sometimes a cohort can be based on that segmentation that you did earlier, but the important thing is that you're looking at like data exactly in the same way with a variable between them, and by looking at them in this really organized way, exactly the same funnel steps as you saw on the other one. So when you're working with your stakeholders, you're very clearly tying it back to the original um, funnel metric that you had or whatever your business model is. And then by, by really breaking it out by these cohorts, you can learn a tremendous amount about where you're having impact and where you're not over time. And this is net effects. So in this particular example, same retail site, um, same thing with the, in, most retail sites have a huge bump in December and then this corresponding sort of trough in January. So the question at any retail site is, how are you going to sort of balance that out? And how do you know you're getting better when your volume numbers are just all over the place, depending on sales and whatever else is going on, seasonality? So the question is, are you getting better? Is your product actually getting better? And when you look at it by a cohort view, you can very clearly see very quickly whether or not the net effect of the changes that you're making are having an effect. So in this case, you know, November's looking pretty good. Here's your sort of, a, think of it as your baseline metrics. You have a certain click rate, you have a certain engagement rate, you have a certain purchase rate, and that yields your, your end result. How many, how many sales did we make? December is a complete blowout, right? You have a huge number of people. Everybody's buying <laughs> in December. It doesn't even matter what it is. They just need a gift. So everybody's buying. And so your click rate goes up, and your engagement rate is out through the roof, and your purchase rate's crazy, and you, you make a ton. Most people, most retail sites make all their money basically during the holidays, or many do, not all. Um, so December is really, really important. But the question is when January comes and you've spent all this time improving your product, 
you know, did you improve the product? How do you separate out these huge volume swings from how did you, how's the product doing? And by breaking it out in this way and really looking at those same metrics over time, you can see in this case, there was a very subtle but real improvement in click rate, a very small but real engagement rate in increase, and purchase rate remained flat. But the net in January, because of those product improvements, and directly attributable to those product improvements, even though you have less traffic coming in, you're able to show that you actually have a higher number of purchases because of these relatively subtle changes in your funnel. So that optimization becomes super clear when you can cut up the data in a, in a way that is, is very, very structured. Let's do a clarification question. Yep. Yeah. So let's say number of purchases which you're trying to increase. You throw in an offer like 40% off, it doubles down, but then is another product manager looking at the revenue or average cart size? Yeah, yeah. Fighting with you for that or? Not fighting, but I mean. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always a lot of complexity about promotions. Um, and some companies are better than others about managing the level of promotion at any given time. But yeah, if this was real, like if I was really doing like real metrics for like my boss, <laughs> you know, or uh, presenting CEO, yeah, you'd include in your funnel those rates about um, basket size and purchase uh, and, per, and, and average uh, item size so you're in the order. On both at the same you're working time. on both problems at the same time. Yeah, and you'd break out your funnel in that case to show those very clearly because if it was the case that you just like, you know, you did a big discount, so of course they bought more stuff, that would play out when you, you know, if you had a much bigger slide, you'd be able to show the final revenue numbers and see. Yeah, you would just have it in there all the time. I just didn't have that much room. Yeah. Okay, cohorts. Nothing's more fun than cohorts. Okay, local metrics. So right, we've been talking a lot about stuff that's connected. So everything is sort of connected to these end outcomes. And your funnel is like a, a logical set of, of measurable steps that lead to outcomes. But sometimes you're measuring stuff that actually doesn't ladder up. It's, you're just measuring it for its own sake to understand that part of your business. And it doesn't necessarily like totally connect to revenue or to purchases or to whatever, you know, re renewals in the subscription or whatever it is that your funnel is about. Sometimes you just have to measure them so that you know the health of your business. And I think of these like a, like a pilot who's flying a plane and he's got all those dials or she's got all those dials and you're watching each dial and each dial is telling you something a little bit different. Each one of them is not something that you're going to change the way that you fly, but you might make some small correction based on that. So I think of these as local metrics, and I report on them very differently. Um, so these, I just give some examples here. These are things that are really not in and of themselves actionable. And sometimes you find yourself, at least I have in product management, being, being told or asked to like, work on these because it's going to have a big impact on the business. And the very first question is, how is that going to have a big impact on the business? Like, help me understand why this is important and, and what the outcome is. Not to say that they're not important, but just being able to really clearly say, like, yeah, it, we really need to improve these, but are they going to have the outcome that you think that they're going to have? And how do you sort of lay that out? So I think of these as local metrics. Very important, but measured a little bit differently and reported very differently. Basically, you, if you see an, uh, something go up or down, you don't know what to do to fix it. That's kind of the difference in, in, for me between local and actionable. If I see user satisfaction go up, I'm like, yay. <laughs> but you don't know why necessarily, right? You have to do more research to understand why it went up or to try to fix the problem of why it went down. But just the metric itself isn't going to tell you. Whereas in our actionable metrics, you know kind of what the outcome is going to be, and you kind of know like where you need to go to fix it. That's not always the case for these local metrics. So um, particularly for local metrics, but really for any metric, one of the biggest questions that come up, and I just recently, in the last few weeks, had a very, very long and contentious debate about with a coworker who is brilliant, much smarter than me, um, about whether or not we should use an absolute value or a ratio to define a metric. <laughs> and we spent, I am not kidding you, more than two weeks talking about this. And I was ready to 
like go home and have a glass of wine, but we come in every day and we would talk about it some more. So values and ratios, this is a, you know, sometimes you just get this deep in the data and you just need to figure it out. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to share this part of my life with you and bring you into the madness that is my world and talk about how we sort of made decisions about this um, because it was kind of fascinating. So values are very specific to the, the volume that you're dealing with. And they show growth in absolute terms. And perhaps obviously, of course you want to measure this, for sure. But is it the way that you want to present your metrics when you're really understanding the health of the business? This is where the debate came in. Ratios and percentages, they give you the relationship between information bits but they don't necessarily tell you if it's like bigger or smaller in an absolute way. So in the end, after this very long and contentious discussion, we decided that we needed to measure both. Um, but I will show you, because it was fascinating, um, what it was. So, oh, whoops. so I work on matching, which is people come on to Hired and they post a job, and then candidates come on to Hired and they want a job, and we match them and we put them in a list, we rank them. Just like search, we rank them. And that ranking is really important because employers come in and they look at that list in order. <laughs> and in fact, they're very structured about it. They stop, they start at the top and they work their way down. So if I put somebody at the top, they are by definition going to get more attention and time than the person I put at number five and number 10. So it's really important to get that ranking right. So what we are looking at here is the number of, I put it in terms of uh, retail because we've just been using that throughout, but number of sales from the top five, how many times when people bought, did they find that item in the top five? And then the, this one down here is the percent of sales from the top five. So what percent of the time did they find that item in the top five? Same metric, just a different way of presenting it. And you can see from these graphics how wildly different they look. So. We, it took like much data before we sort of teased out what was going on, but if you looked at this, you'd think there's a tremendous amount of variation in our product. You'd also think that we had a really terrible week right here. Um, and if you look at this data, you'd see a trough here, but then you'd see a relatively flat amount here. So the point is, just, is not to say that one is right and the other is wrong. It's just to say that the way that you pull that data and the way that you present it, and even if I had just changed like, you know, I changed the scale <laughs> of, the, of the chart, right? I can make that metric look flat very easily. Um, but that, all these things have a really big difference. And the choice between percent and number ended up really changing the way that we approach the product. Because when we were just looking at this, we would have had a little bit of a freak out session at the, at when this data came in about why did we tank? Like what went wrong that our volume went down this much, you know? And you know, same thing here. And here we'd be congratulating ourselves, but when we look at it this way, we see actually we did have a problem, and then we started to figure out how to fix it um, down here. So I know it's not a silver bullet, but it's just to say it's worth having that very painful two-week-long debate when necessary. Hopefully, only 20 minutes for you guys. Um, to figure out the right way to measure, because once you start looking at that data in that consistent, reliable way, it's gonna tell you a story, and you need to know how to hear that story accurately and use that data in a really consistent and actionable way. Setting goals. How are we on time, actually? Where's my, where's my Sam? This is my time manager. Um, are we good on time? Okay, so setting goals, this is also a big part of every product manager's job. I'm sure you've seen the SMART, has everyone seen SMART goals mm -hmm. before? This is like very standard uh, consulting speak, um, but it's actually really, really helpful. So SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. I like to add this meaningful one <laughs> because sometimes a goal can be all of the other things but it just doesn't matter. It's just not gonna move your business. And I, and I'm sure many of you have spent lots of time on projects where you're halfway through and you're like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, what is the purpose of this? We just spent three weeks like doing this, but I don't, 
I'm sort of unclear on like what we expect to happen uh, when we're done. And you're like, oh, we're going to move this number. But like, does it matter that you move that number? Um, so I have a great, fun example for this. Um, so, and this is real. <laughs> I was just like telling you like the, the horror stories of, of, my, of my career today. Um, so uh, we were concerned about acquisition costs. Acquisition costs, um, we're back to our, uh, uh, this is another retail example. They're not all from the same company, by the way. These are different retail companies. But concerned about acquisition costs, new customers cost a ton to acquire. So how do you bring those costs down? One of the best ways to decrease costs is to not pay for those customers. That is like the cheapest way <laughs> to get customers is when you don't have to pay for them. So I'm sure anyone who's worked at a place where you're bringing in new customers talks about organic traffic all the time. How are we going to increase organic? Because organic is free. They're free. I love free. Um, but how are you going to do it? So we actually made a Q1 goal. Actually, I don't remember what quarter it was, to be honest. But we made a goal to double our organic traffic. That is a good goal. That is solid. That is achievable. It was in the quarter. It was measurable. It was fun. So it worked. We, we had a great SEO person who did a really fabulous job. He worked on a, on a big content strategy. We wrote articles. We had beautiful pictures. Our design team worked overtime and like really made it great. We had this wonderful content. People loved the content. We had blog posts and interviews and videos and live Facebook events and all this stuff. It was like a true content strategy. It was awesome. And we totally hit the goal. We totally hit it. It was awesome. Organic traffic and organic purchases doubled. And it doesn't move the business even one tiny little bit. Nothing. Nothing. Basically nothing. We got like a half a dozen, you know, I, what was this, a dozen additional sales? Because organic traffic just doesn't convert. <laughs> it just doesn't convert. And when we did all this, we got lots of great people who loved the content, but they had no intention of buying. And nothing that we did in this content was like, buy me now. It was like, you should really think about this. This is really beautiful. It's really gonna, you know, this is like a really fun thing to think about. And you can take this quiz, and there's this really beautiful video, and here's how you do it once you have it. <laughs> Nobody bought it. Because that is not a purchase strategy. That's a content strategy. And if you're an advertising site, it's awesome. But when you're actually trying to sell people stuff, unless you have a good conversion rate, which we did not have, then it's just not worth the effort to do that if your goal is now, if your goal is just this, that's, all, you know, that's awesome. Like, content team did great. Not, I don't want to devalue the work they did, which was awesome. But if we had put that same amount of time and effort into our product pages and really into like, the, the product purchasing button and explaining why that cost was worth what it cost, and if we put that effort into even just literally the money that we spent paying the people for that time and developing all that content, if we literally just put that into paid advertising, we would have gotten more sales. So being really clear about the outcome is awesome. But knowing that that outcome is actually going to drive your core metric is even more awesome. So I encourage you to just sort of bring that with you next time you get a great content idea <laughs> or something else where you're not clear. Like if you can't explain how the numbers work out, then they probably don't, right? I mean, you know, maybe. But it's worth spending a little time to say, like, let's say we blew it out of the water. What happens? Because if we had just made this chart <laughs> before we started, we just wouldn't have spent that quarter doing it. We just didn't take the time to do it. OK, stakeholder management. I've talked a lot about it throughout here. I personally find this to be the most challenging part about being a product manager is telling, explaining people how decisions are going to be made and having them be part of that decision. and then communicating back out what we're doing and when we're doing it and what happened when we did it and why we didn't do it or, you know, whatever. Stakeholder management. So I just thought I would take a second to, like, reiterate what you probably hear every day in your, in your day jobs or when you come to things like this. Um, but stakeholder management 101, um, really being open but really being focused on the metrics. So if you can always show your funnel and show your segmentation and show your cohorts and show how you're prioritizing your work based on the outcomes that you think that those changes are going to yield, all those conversations become a lot easier. Because you're saying, that's a great idea. Shh, 
show me the part where the number is supposed to change. Help me see the vision that you see for why this is a great idea. Not just in a, you know, in a great ideas kind of way, but like where in the funnel, where in the cohort are you going to see the metric move? That really helps clarify all those conversations. And then again, like making those connections to the, in the data, really important. Showing the results in a consistent way. I know I'm a broken record, but especially with the product managers who I've reported to me, I'm like, that's a different chart. <laughs> Why is it different? You know, show the same chart. It might be boring, but it's effective and people remember and learn over time. You sort of training your stakeholders on how you think and then really giving frequent updates on how it's going and what you've learned and what you haven't learned. People just like to know what's going on. Even if you can't point to an outcome yet, you can at least say like, just as a reminder, this is why we're doing it, but here's kind of how long it's taking. Okay, I'm done. And now I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, well, there probably is like an ever, ever, a never ending level of detail that's possible. I think that's really hard and usually it comes over time you realize, just like the question that came up earlier about like, well, what about revenue and, you know, what about like the cost of the products and all that. You, as you start to talk about it with stakeholders, you'll see where they are sort of poking holes in your argument and you'll realize at that point you need more information. If you also are noticing that um, over time you're not seeing movement in certain areas, then probably you can, you can push them together. Because the idea is to measure at the level that you're going to take action. And so, you know, like engagement, I showed like, then there's engagement. <laughs> you know, but that's actually probably for most products, that engagement piece is sort of like a never-ending series of steps and possible pathways that you, you do need to measure. I think the idea is to try to condense it as much as you can and still get the insight that you need to know where you're going to focus to, to move that lever, right? And try to, you know, it's definitely more art than science, but like where does it show you like that part? That's the part I need to move. Um, that all should help. Oh, look at that, magic. Okay, how do you measure actions that happen off your platform? For example, how would REI measure if they're fulfilling their mission to help people opt outside? So this is a great question. There are a lot of off-platform stuff. And my question to you is like, is that a product? Is that part of the product? Um, like, as, if you define your product, and this is part of it, is it part of your your funnel for success in your product. And if it is, that's great. Sometimes there are off-funnel things that you're measuring. Um, and then know, and know whether it's a local metric. This feels, this is like me, like I don't really know how RAI does this, but I think some sort of regular survey mechanism would give you that, that outcome. You'd be able to measure at least for some set of customers whether they're actually going outside. But I would consider that to be a local metric because um, because it has, it has its own thing. It's not leading up to a bigger funnel. Uh, what's your North Star metric, or the most important metric at Hired, and how often does it change? Uh, well, we just finished the, planning, the quarterly planning process, which is a total joy in every possible way. Um, and this, <laughs> this metric, this question comes up all the time. Um, so at Hired, the North Star metric is hires <laughs> like no doubt <laughs> everything that we do is about yeah we want lots of people on coming on to hire people we want companies on there hiring people we want candidates on there finding jobs but if they cannot find each other then we are failing so they must get hired that's our that's our north star metric and everything ladders up to that in some way there's a question in the back I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Things that are the beginning of the product cycle and new and emerging market, how would you look at or what would you look at things to consider in the beginning of the product? You mean like before you really know your funnel? 
Okay, like a new business. Okay, so the question is, when, you, when your funnel is kind of unclear, where do you start to measure? Is that accurate? Um, yeah, how do you know what's important? Yeah, that is such a great question, and it's so context specific, it's a little hard for me to answer. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a way to approach that that might be helpful uh, for you. I think the most important thing is to really come back to that outcome because if you can define your what's the outcome, then you can ladder back to what are the steps that we would need to see happen to get that outcome. And actually, I'll give you a little story about Hired that's kind of interesting. Um, so Hired originally started as an auction. So literally, software developers, engineers, went on the site and they got auctioned <laughs> off to the highest bidder. They were like, I do Ruby. How much are you gonna pay for Ruby? You know, and people paid a lot. <laughs> so then they brought on more people, and they were, it was an auction site for a long time. I mean, in Silicon Valley, long time means like a number of months, <laughs> you know, but um, maybe a year. I'm not sure. It was before my time. So, you know, at, at auction time, it was probably like number of, of uh, auctions, you know, number of, of candidates actually getting picked up at auction. Because I'm assuming that they had some kind of minimum offer, <laughs> you know, like at Sotheby's, like you have to pay a certain amount or you don't get them. Um, but uh, so really knowing what your outcome is, what is that? If you can't answer that, then maybe it's a little too early to, 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 to really have metrics. <laughs> you know, maybe what you're doing then is you're really trying to figure out, like, what am I trying to do? And, and that's a great question, right? That's a big product question in and of itself. But it is from that that all the metrics will follow. I would like to learn your idea about comparison metrics. Generally, uh, in the slides, it was month over month, mm -hmm. but also we can do the year over year. So yeah. the quality of month over month is some months have holidays or a lot of dependencies. But like how to know? It's like in the year past, a lot of things has changed. So generally, which one do you use? OK, yeah. So the question is, when you're, when you're trying to figure out what sort of time period to use, how do you normalize that data? Um, that is like such a complicated question. I think that. Different companies do this different ways. Um, generally speaking, you accept that there is a certain amount of variation, and you just sort of notate it and so that it's clear when you're looking at the data or using the data that you understand what those are. You don't necessarily have to normalize it out. Um, when in certain types of analysis, um, and I'm, this is sort of starting to get into like statistical analysis, you actually need to remove the data that's unusual um, to get statistical significance. Um, that's, that's really measurable. Like when we did tests, um, uh, a, a lot of A-B testing, we actually took parts of the population out because they were atypical for the note, or we would, we would normalize the amount of time such that the, the statistical significance could be exact. Um, but in most cases, uh, the product, most of the products that people work on, you just accept that there's a little bit of variation and you need to know that like February is a short month and um, you know this month has more weekends than that month or um, whatever, and, 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 and just understand those. It, usually the effort of trying to normalize isn't, isn't worth the normalization value, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on, on how statistically significant you need that data to be. And for most of us, it's probably not that important. Yeah. yeah. All right, I want to go back because I feel bad that I'm not counting the people who did the work of putting this into the, mm -hmm. the thing. How do you attribute success to changes happening at the same time? For example, user, fa user interface change and a campaign at the same time. Um, yeah, this is such a great question. So whenever there's those individual items, ideally you're measuring both the local effects of the test that you're running or the campaign or um, whatever the interface change. Ideally, you're measuring them separately. So um, right now, these days, it's like so easy if you have enough traffic um, to run an A-B test. When you do that, you can, you can look at data and see the, the specific outcome for each of those changes separately. You may have a situation where the user interface change was positive. You did an A-B test. The, the test population was positive. You actually did a great thing. And you could also have a situation where you had a great campaign running at the same time. And then when you look at your cohort analysis for that month, you actually might see a dip. Right? That, that can happen. So being able to disambiguate the net effects from the individual campaigns, it's important to really understand what you're looking at. And in the case that something like that happens, where you have some stuff going up and some stuff going down, 
um, being able to like really sort of pull that apart, that's kind of like the hard work of, <laughs> of metrics is the like, okay, well the, that difference is, you know, 40% of that change is attributable to the campaign and maybe another 20% is attributable to the user interface change. If you have enough granularity about the size of those populations, you can pull those out. It's a, it's a lot of work, um, but it is, it is possible. Uh, how does the funnel work with returning customers? Ah, yes, I love returning customers. So um, usually new and returning behave very differently. So in, in any funnel that I've ever worked on, we always did a segmentation between new and returning. So that was just like table stakes, like new and returning. Yeah. And I asked that question. So I guess there's another part to it too, which was say someone's bought your product, so like Netflix, they've signed up. Yeah. Do you care about them? Because the funnel was going to buy time. After buy time, what's... You, yeah. Are you caring about them then? Yeah, oh yeah. So um, for, so in that specific example where you have a, a subscription product, um, you're looking at the data at a sort of cascade level. So you're always looking new versus new, like net new, this cohort versus net new, different cohort, you know, January versus February versus March. You're looking at the data in that cut. And then you're also looking at exactly that same cut for returning and also by tenure. So we would divide it by tenure too. So like second month, third month. Do you see what I'm saying? So we would break it out to that level and we would just look at them all. It just takes a long time. But it's important to understand, and this is where segmentation and cohorts work together. So your cohort analysis is just like a fancy way of saying like how you look at your segments or how you look at your funnels over, over time. Um, it's important to really understand where you see that, that variation. So for example, and, and not just at Netflix with subscription where it's very clear because there's a start and then there's a subscription at the end of the month, like success is like binary. That's awesome. That makes it super easy. Um, but when success isn't binary, like in retail, you're saying like, this person bought, they might buy again, you know? Did they buy again this month? Well, I don't know, but they might buy again next month. You know, subscription, you're either in or out. Or you may come back, that's like another level. But in, in a place like retail, you're saying new is new, but returning has five different definitions or 10. So what we would do is do some offline analysis, like sort of deep, deep dive analysis is what I would call it, to understand those trends of returning customers, how many months usually go by before the second purchase. And then we would set our cohorts according to that normalized set of data. So we, we would normally say like, if someone purchases at X time, then they're, pro they're most likely to purchase again within three months or never. And then we would look at the data through that lens and look at the cohorts by that way. But you'd sort of like use the data to guide. You can't look at everything or you'll be, you know, you'll never make any decisions. So you just have to figure out like, okay, what really matters in this, in this repeat purchase flow and then look for those trigger points in your, in your funnel. Okay, what tests or actions do you take when you move a metric like number of purchases upward but revenue remains stagnant or even decreases? Yeah, so this actually, this, is, uh, this came at a question, I think it was your question from before about like, what are the other factors? So there's our funnel, and there's factors that we just didn't have in that funnel, like um, what's the actual like, number of items in a purchase, and what's the, uh, the average cost of the items in the purchase, and then the total basket size. So in retail in particular, it's, it's usually that. Every business has their own set of metrics that make up these sort of other things that affect your revenue. And the important thing is to know what those baselines are, and be able to look at your funnels with those baselines in place. So you just need to break out your funnel to the extent that you can see that level of detail um, and, and that'll give you this action. In this case, you just wanna figure out why. Like, did they buy less items or did they just buy cheaper items? And sometimes you can make changes to fix that. You can promote different things or you can sort of um, change your mix. Sometimes that's possible, not always. Yes. Uh, I guess maybe it's specific to hired or something similar, but um, after they are hired, do you then ever track like the length of time they stay with the position or anything like that? Um, yeah. Like, you know, I guess it would be kind of like returns similar. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> track when people come back for another job. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't always know if someone's like happy and yeah. stayed or whether they like moved to another state, you know. Do you like ever like send out surveys like, hey, how do you like your new position? Um, you know, actually, I don't know the answer to that. Um, 
We do. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's gotten one. I'm just saying. Um, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I haven't been there for very long, and, uh, and I'm glad someone else was able to answer. Nice. So the answer is yes, surveys. <laughs> okay. At Hired, who leads the entire consumer's journey from awareness to retention, product or product marketing? Oh, we work so closely across all the teams. It is like, we're like this. Um, so actually, we have a really strong senior leadership team, and they actually do work really closely together. Um, like I'm working on a product right, I'm working on an initiative right now, and my closest partner is the marketing guy who decides how much to spend on new customer acquisition. Um, so really, we do try to do it together, um, and basically, we use the same funnel. So we're all we're looking at the same metrics, and so when he's talking about what he's doing, it dovetails with anything I'm doing, and we're, we're just not in conflict because. We know what the different things matter. He's got a budget. He's going to spend it. But it's going to affect the same funnel as my product changes. So we, we do actually at Hired work really closely together. I know not every organization has that luxury, but, but we do. I, I strongly suggest trying to get that alignment because <laughs> it really helps. Uh, OK, in addition to measuring product and campaign success, how do you measure your success as a PM? And how do you measure success in your career? Oh, boy. OK. <laughs> so all the easy questions. Thank you. Um, so this is probably the most personal question. Um, so I don't. I, don't, I never in my entire life have ever asked myself, how am I doing as a PM? <laughs> like, am I a good PM? You know, I ask myself, like, are my stakeholders happy? Is my boss happy? Do I like this job? Do I want to do this anymore? Um, but I don't actually like think about that. I, I really think about it in terms of the stakeholder. Am I moving the metric? Am I getting the product where it needs to go? Are the things we're doing yielding results? And whatever it takes to get there is like kind of what's on the table. So I never really think about it that way in my life. And this is like not to get super personal on you guys, but. In my life, I think about, is my job letting me live the life I want to live? And I have a five-year-old who is so freaking cute, who is in bed right now, and I am not kissing him goodnight, because I'm here with you guys, who I love too. Um, but that's really how I think about it. So being a PM is like super stressful. I work, you know, at one minute I've got like the new VP of marketing who's like, bah! And then the other minute, I've got like the sales organization who's like, we got to sell this thing. How are we going to sell this thing? And then, um, you know, and, but at the end, it's like, it's a great group of people. I really enjoy working with them. I'm able to communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I feel at the end of a week that I'm moving this thing forward. And for me, um, moving this thing forward is like, I'm helping people in my little way find great jobs. And... I feel really good about that. Helping people find jobs feels really, really good. And I got my job through Hired, and lots of other people have gotten their jobs through Hired. I feel really good about that. I think there have been other jobs I've had where even when we had tremendous success, I sometimes would come home at the end of the week or the quarter and be like, yeah, we hit our numbers, but I didn't you know, see my husband for like a week, you know, or um, you know, other considerations. So I know this is maybe too personal for, for this discussion, but, but when I think about success, I really do think about it in like very human terms. OK, back to metrics. How do you A-B test matching companies with job seekers? So the sad thing is that we don't always have enough people to A-B test at a very granular level. So um, A-B testing requires volume. and the smaller your conversion rate is, the bigger your volume needs to be. And there are days when I'm like, oh, gosh, I wish I had the luxury that we had at Netflix where I could run a 12-cell test in a week. <laughs> uh, you know, but we just don't. We just don't have that volume. right? We're matching people to jobs. There aren't you know, thousands happening at any given time. So we reserve A-B testing for when we can test something that has like, a pretty high conversion rate and a large volume. Um, in other cases, we just use different methodologies to try to get um, actionable results. So if it's low volume, is it a fairly manual process to increase like, the accuracy? And oh, yeah. Accuracy is like very fuzzy, right? Like if, you're, if, I, if you come from statistical A-B testing, you're like, whoa, what, <laughs> what, 12? 
is that the number 12? <laughs> um, but yeah, you just have to find other ways. Like you're using a lot more of like directional data and data over time. At, at Hired, it's all about liquidity. So we're, we're literally trying to get enough companies looking for that particular type of candidate and those candidates, enough of those candidates on the platform at the same time. So our goal is like liquidity. Like you're looking, they're looking, can you find each other now? Can you find each other now at quality? Um, and sometimes that, you, you know, it's a little more uh, hand wavy than I would like. With that in mind, uh, Arisen's, like, can you talk about quality approaches? To moving the needle, obviously. When you got, when you can't A/B test, yeah. Like, me? Obviously, you've got quantitative, and that's what you're, you've really talked about a lot. But can you tie together? The yeah. And sure. So um, we do a lot of user testing, actually, and we do a lot of talking to our clients and trying to understand things like candidate volume and candidate quality and the quality of the matching. Obviously, for me, is like a really big deal. Um, so there are some places where I can use data quality of matching, uh, like I li I'm, I'm partial, maybe you could tell that I like the percent because knowing like what percent of people who found a candidate found them at the top tells me how hard the clients are working and I can see that in the data. So if 80% if of our clients are finding a candidate that they wanna talk to at the top of that list, then I know I've made their job easier. I've made it easier for them to find that candidate and that's real data, even though it's not like statistically significant, it's real data. And it really tells me that 80% of the time they found the candidate in the top X number of results. And I can see if that number goes up or down when we make changes to the logic. Um, so it's really important to find that metric that is moving in a way that you can see and you get a, you get a sense over time of how, how real that is. Um, percentages are really good for that because you can compare them over time. You know, last month <laughs> we saw 80% and this month we saw 72%. And then we can sort of unpack what, what happened. Um, in other places, like um, we serve a lot of different types of worker. Um, in, other, in other places, we're literally looking for trend lines. So we might graph out the data. And even though the actual absolute numbers are kind of you know, not that high, we can see variations in the shape, in the shape of the curve. And that helps us see sort of what's happening. So it's, it's numbers and it's metrics, but it's just not the same kind of statistically significant um, response that you get like with an A-B test. It's, you might be wrong, basically. You have a higher risk of being wrong. Um, but if it's what you've got, then it's kind of the best you, you can do with that data. And it's usually pretty good. I mean, if you think about how most decisions are made, if your company is different, you know, God bless you and, and you're very lucky, but I think a lot of decisions get made by like, that's a great idea! You know, so any data is better than that. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I was talking more about, you know, um, using user research more as the drive yeah. for oh, yeah. product decisions rather than sure. statistical and non-statistical. Yeah. I just hadn't seen much of a link between design and yeah. product. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we do, we actually use a lot. We do a lot of interviewing. Um, we've also, like just this week, uh, some examples, card sorts are great for information um, to know whether or not what you're doing makes sense, if there's a better way to do it. Um, we also do a lot of surveys, surveying, um, you got one it sounds like, I, I wasn't a part of that one, but we do a lot of surveys to say like, you're hiring for this kind of candidate, um, you know, what are you finding, what are you not finding, and that helps to drive product decisions as well. And those are sort of non-metric related data. I also just spend a ton of time on the phone talking to customers on both sides of the marketplace. You know, like, hey, you're DevOps, like, what do you do? <laughs> um, and, or like, you're hiring for DevOps, so like, what are you looking for? Like, can you walk me through, like, when you're looking at this person's resume, like, what are you looking for? Um, and then we try to figure out, like, okay, they're looking for this information, are we asking them that question? Do we need to ask them that question? That, that informs a lot of our product decisions. It's like, what are the specifics around the hiring process and how can we flesh out the, date, the information that either side needs to know to make a decision about whether to extend a job offer or accept a job offer and try to get that information front and center.